Hi, good morning. Um, I'm here uh, to read a, an excerpt from my new book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, um, as I've been doing every weekday and will continue until May 26. So thanks so much for joining. Um, as you know by now I've been I wrote this book as a love letter to anybody who wants to help heal our fractured fragile and ultimately beautiful worlds um, our institutions are are not working they've run their course we've not imagined um, with what to replace them and so people who have certainty that it's one system or another system increasingly make me nervous because what we need to do is not focus on tactics alone, but what we really need is a mindset shift, a different way of approaching each other, of listening, as I've written and talked about, holding opposing values and truths in tension. And that work is hard. It is long, sometimes decades long. And so this chapter, this practice, Chapter 13, um, called Embrace the Beautiful Struggle, is really about a secret that I've come to learn that we in the, in the world of change makers talk about far too little. And that is that while this work is incredibly difficult, there's beauty to be found really at every step of the journey, including in the dark moments. You can see that right now in this moment of crisis where we're also seeing new parts of ourselves come alive. Um, and on the external, we're seeing art flourishing, new practices, new levels of tenderness and kindness. And so I, I, I write about beauty not as an aesthetic, although it's part of it, but beauty as acts of showing up, of the way that we pay attention to one another. The phrase itself comes from Dr. Martin Luther King, who in one of the last speeches of his life talked about the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for rights and justice. As I read, um, please put any questions that you have in the um, in the chat box and I will do my best to answer. But here goes. In November 1992, several friends and I trekked the Borneo rainforest accompanied by two hardy guides, Mustafa and Goon. We were there to explore the forest ecosystem, natural and human. The trip was rough going at times. We trudged for weeks along narrow pathways through dense, unforgiving vegetation. We would have been wearied by the intense humidity that kept our clothing perpetually damp, had a constant flow of leeches not jumped onto our limbs and distracted us with more pressing concerns. At night, random bugs and enormous beetles had a way of crawling into our sleeping bags. Our fresh food ran out after a few days leaving us with only heaping piles of rice and canned sardines for meals. Yet, we daily experienced wonder and were regularly astonished by the lushness of layered jungle terrain punctuated by shafts of sunlight peeking through the filigree forest canopy overhead. Our guides were delightful. Though their English was basic at best, Mustafa and Goon helped us witness firsthand the cost of human activity wrought by commercial logging, stopping to point toward groves of tree stumps and wide roads plunging violently in what used to be fertile forest. We didn't spot a single mammal on the journey and heard just one gibbon call out to others. As for the local people, an, in, an Indonesianization process, policy, had consigned nomadic tribes to reservation like villages, uprooting them from their homes and denying them their culture. 
In the course of our journey, I began to see more clearly the symbiotic relationship between human beings and the environment. Men hauled teak and other hardwoods from the rainforest to sell across the world. Animals lost their habitat, and humans lost part of the world's lungs. Native peoples could not sustain themselves under the onslaught, and the entire world pay, paid a price. Here, at the source of our shared ecosystem, the violence of poverty and greed were palpable. Both guides seemed to sense when I was feeling nearly overwhelmed by the destruction wrought by human beings' thirst for things. In these moments, the guides would attempt to distract me from my ruminations, directing my attention to an exotic orchid or tangled vines or moon shadows dancing across the trunks of skinny trees shimmying in the night breeze. I'd find in the astonishing beauty around me a sign of life urging itself to survive. I'd also hear an admonition of what we would lose if we didn't repair the world. On one of our final nights in the rainforest, the Borneo journey gifted the group a moment of transcendence. At the end of a long, sweltering day, we rested in a small clearing. We were all bone tired, unrestored by the sticky sponge baths we'd taken in a nearby Blackwater Creek. We ate what we could of our regular canned dinner and then sat silently with our guides beneath the veil of mosquito net netting. Knowing we were near the end of our adventure, I was desperate to convey my gratitude and admiration to the guides. But with no knowledge of Bahasa, the guide's language, I could only express rudimentary thoughts through my words. But if we lacked a common language, I reasoned, maybe there were songs we shared. I started to sing, hoping I'd hit a tune the guides would recognize. After trying and failing with at least a dozen songs, I finally chanced upon one of my favorite Christmas carols, Silent Night, Holy Night. All is calm, all is bright. Upon hearing the familiar tune, Mustafa and Goon smiled and began to sing. The others joined in and our little group became a choir, harmonizing in four languages, English, Bahasa, German, and French. I felt myself extended, not only to my fellow journeyers, but to the forest around us and all its living things. Long, arduous days immersed in nature had stripped us of artifice, granting us access to a deeper level of knowing, somehow. The night's flickering lights and unbidden symphony illuminated the possible, expanding my soul's longing to know that all could be healed. Silent night, holy night. When we finally could sing no more, the six of us held hands for a moment and bowed to the divinity we experienced in each other. That night, I went to sleep full of awe and secure in my belief of an illimitable consciousness that binds us with all living things. I silently recommitted to work toward human dignity and a more sustainable earth. And I understood then that skills and resources are not enough to solve our problems. We must ground our systems in a spiritual foundation big enough to sustain our astonishing diversity. Such a foundation is based on the notion of transcendence, that all living things are interconnected and that we are deserving of dignity. Humans growing awareness of our interdependence is driving peoples across the planet to reimagine and try to live by a new set of guiding principles. I see this in the growing army of social entrepreneurs across the globe, including those you've met in these pages. Some are devoted to expanding human possibilities. Others are fighting to save the planet, to reverse the march of so many species toward extinction, to temper the destructive elements of technology. No matter your field, there is much to learn from activists imagining and building new systems together for our 21st century world. More than a quarter century since that night in Borneo rainforests, my youthful aspirations feel affirmed 
when I see the progress we're making in reimagining a new economic system that is both inclusive and sustainable. Yet I'm bemused when young people earnestly ask me how I can be so old and still so passionate about my commitment to work toward dignity despite all the inevitable setbacks and failures. I feel a growing sense of urgency to do more in the decades that lie in front of me. All of us know that the work of change is hard, that it is long, sometimes decades long, sometimes lifetimes long. So how do any of us sustain? Every change agent must find within herself the strength to carry on through the dark times and the courage to push against a resistant status quo, not just for a couple of years, but potentially for decades. Anger can go a long way, yet it eventually whittles the soul. External awards may be reinforcing, yet whatever comfort they provide is fleeting. Any honor bestowed by others can be taken away. There must be something more, something that nourishes the spirit and make slogging for years through the mud and grime of social change bearable. I have found sustenance in a part of the journey that few talked about when I began, beauty. To fat paraphrase Dr. King, there is beauty in struggle. There is beauty around us, beacons of the possible, especially if we still ourselves long enough to recognize it. Beauty inspires and motivates. Beauty sustains. The key is for each of us to define what beauty means for us, to think of it not as superfluous or indulgent, but as an essential part of what it means to be human. Life is hard, which may be why humans have insisted on creating beauty in even the darkest times and in the meanest places. In every poor community I have ever visited, beauty manifests. Think of tribes the world over that embellish bowls and farm implements, or weave evocative imagery into everyday fabrics. In the harsh climes of India's and Pakistan's deserts, women collect water wearing the brightest colors imaginable. Multiple clay pots stacked on their heads and steadied with confident arms encircled with sparkly bangles. In war zones, I've witnessed little girls walking down dangerous streets in pretty white party dresses. Even in the grimmest slums, of Kampala or Lagos. Women hang beautifully embroidered diaphanous curtains to cover walls made of corrugated tin, patched with cardboard and coffee cans. Beauty for survival, for bringing life to parched and tired places. Beauty is an expression of human dignity. It resides in the work of showing up, extending ourselves and bringing kindness when we feel like being anything but kind. Beauty lives in the narratives of those who are striving to overcome profound obstacles just to survive. It thrives in the bonds of human connection and the quiet moments of contemplative reflection. Let beauty be a powerful touchstone not only to reinforce your own resolve, but to rejuvenate those you serve. When times are terrible, and few of us escape living without experiencing tragedies and sorrows, there is sustenance and beauty manifested in service, in the arts, in rebuilding what has been destroyed. In 1994, I had the immense privilege of sitting alone with fabled dancers of Cambodia's Royal Ballet at their modest student in Phnom Penh. During the mid to late 1970s, under the Pol Pot regime, the Khmer Rouge army murdered over a million Cambodians, targeting intellectuals and artists. Just 30 classical dancers survived the war, and only three remained living when I visited to learn about their work as part of the Philanthropy Workshop, a program I had created at the Rockefeller Foundation. A petite, gray-haired woman dressed in wide-legged yellow trousers and deep red jacket imparted her recollection of the refugee camps after the war. She was elegant and graceful with a perfect carriage. I would lie in my cot, she said softly and try to piece together the dances, but could only hold on to fragments, she recalled. You see, our dances have been passed down through each generation orally for more than a thousand years. Only we, the dancers, held the key to reviving this part of our nation's heritage. 
I desperately hoped that other dancers might still be alive, trying to remember, as I was. These women's recollections were linked to the dance's revival and their immortality. Once the surviving dancers had found one another, they pledged to train their grandchildren's generation. Their daughter's generation had already grown too old. In the ancient techniques of the royal ballet, she spoke calmly, slowly, her gaze straight at me while tears trickled down her face, not once lifting her hand to dry her cheeks. Suddenly, little girls pranced into the studio for practice. Watching the class, I was mesmerized as the elderly women stood at the center of the room, clapping to the beguiling rhythms of age-old music played by old men with slender, creative hands sitting at the edge of the dance floor. Little fairy pixies pirouetted around the, womb, uh, around the women, a circular rainbow of fluttering, iridescent silks surrounding slender, wise old trees. The bland room metamorphosed, metamorphosed into an enchanted garden. After unimaginable bloodshed and loss, I thought to myself, there is dance. There is a new generation to teach. And in that new generation is a chance for rebirth. The elderly dancers, nearly annihilated, were honoring what was most beautiful about the nation's past and building it into the future. Forging a hard edged hope out of suffering, beauty, and faith. Faith does not have to be religious, and prayer can take a thousand forms. We are on dangerous ground when faith becomes associated with political parties, or when non-believers are seen as heretics rather than seekers. A moral framework for an interdependent world has no place for religious practices that divide. What matters instead is that we agree to at least some shared moral principles that enable our collective human flourishing. In whatever form faith takes for you, I wish you a reservoir from which you can draw sustenance. May you find ways and rituals to remind you to be present in the world, to be grateful. When you are broken or exhausted, and you will be, remember beauty, gratitude, faith, and love. Remember that in the struggle, there is a beauty that endures. Remember that there will be beauty in moments of tragedy, as well as in times of shared celebration. But most important, remember that beauty is inside you, if you let it be. Um, so I don't know if you have questions. I am going to be looking and thank you for your lovely uh, comments. And if you don't have questions, I can read a little bit more um, because I have actually, um, I actually have a part in this chapter where I talk about some of the, the beautiful rituals that I have seen um, in religious and non-religious peoples but it means I have to go backwards. Here's a question. Thanks, Juliet. How do you find beauty in the midst of this COVID crisis when so many are struggling? You know, through this book, um, I talk about holding um, opposites in tension. And, um, and that's the same here. Um, I don't really believe in easy optimism if you haven't figured that out by now. I think it's important that we embrace both the beautiful while we recognize the hard um, and acknowledge that many around us are suffering and suffering greatly. But as I said at the beginning, um, I'm finding new rituals um, and hearing of new rituals, individuals that... Um, like so many um, people I've met in India who are Jain, who will do things in the morning like feed birds or plant gardens to remind themselves that we're all connected, that beauty is the urge to live. Um, I have a, a, a young friend from Pakistan 
who tells me that when he touches his head to the ground for morning prayer, um, he thinks of the earth and all people and how he is connected to it. Um, every night before my husband and I have dinner, we light candles and um, hold hands and talk about what we're grateful for. Uh, even if sometimes we have to work really hard to figure out what that is, once we start, the list keeps going. Um, and I think it's, it's this idea, and then to see the spontaneity of it. Uh, for New Yorkers, getting on the rooftop and seeing other New Yorkers waving and cheering and playing music and getting so creative. And one of my neighbor's sends his loudspeaker to, to play New York, New York, and suddenly you see people dancing and um, uh, tapping on tambourines outside their windows. Spontaneous profusions of flowers on the street. All of this is beauty. And, um, and what has motivated me to overcome challenges again and again? Um, I have not finished the work I came to do. You know, I start this book with a story of um, a woman named Felicula. Um, and how at age 26, I, I was building something with a person that I really cared deeply about and then watched her um, get killed in a mysterious accident. And everybody talked about how she was a victim of standing up to the status quo. And, uh, and I just thought, you know, I have to carry forward her work. And it's been 35, 30 years since then, 35 years since then, almost. And now I really feel that I have to carry forward that work. At Acumen, we've actually um, named our offices after some of the people who've most impacted me, um, who tragically lost their lives. A woman named Ingrid Washinawatak um, was an incredibly joyful, beautiful soul. Um, who was a fellow um, with me when I ran and created the Next Generation Leadership Program at Rockefeller. She went down to work with the Uwa Indians, um, peoples rather, in uh, northern Colombia um, at a time of civil war. And she and two of her colleagues were um, captured and tortured and murdered by the FARC or the Revolutionary um, Colombian Army. And oh, it was a horrendous, dark time. It was also the time that the rest of our fellows, who I was technically responsible for, um, were on their way to South Africa, where we were going to spend 10 days looking at this new uh, democracy. And it just so happened, I got there a couple days after because I was trying to work with people supporting, um, figuring out what to do with Ingrid after her murder with her body. And, um, and so um, it just so happened when I arrived, we were spending the day at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Talk about beauty. And the most extraordinary Archbishop uh, Tutu was presiding over this process where people who had done horrendous things to each other were engaged in the beautiful yet unbelievably difficult act of asking one another for forgiveness after saying out loud the horrendous things that they had done. And I'll never forget that night when we sat with um, Archbishop Tutu and he said, humans yearn to be good. Don't forget that. This was a tragic murder. Um, probably done by young boys in the, where things got out of hand and, um, and finding ways to forgive them will free you. And he said, but your job now is to keep Ingrid alive, hold her spirit. And he said, when you meet, have a seat for her, acknowledge her, carry her forward. And so it was very important when we were building our offices with Acumen that there would be a space named for Ingrid, 
a space named for Eni Mugwaneza, who was a moderate and fought for multi-party reform in Rwanda. And like so many moderates, um, was a real threat to the extremists and was one of the first ones killed in the war. And of course, to Felicula. And so these women, their heroic acts, remind me to keep going, um, to pause, and even in the dark times to find beauty. And as the Sufis say so beautifully, dance. Um, I don't want to make up questions. Um, and so, um, although one just came in, uh, what do I mean by hard-edged hope? And really all I mean there is that I get weary from blind optimism. Um, and I actually think that part of what's got us into the mess that we're in um, is just that. People who uh, had a rather naive assumption about the world, world, if we assume that everyone is good or everyone is bad, we don't really build much at all. The key to leading through these very complex times and navigating change is to have the courage and over time to gain the confidence and I suppose gain the courage to, um, to know that we have to develop hard skills, competencies and hold them with love and compassion. And um, that requires embrace, embracing the difficult and the uncomfortable as well as the beautiful. I often say that discomfort is proxy for progress. And so maybe that's another way of finding beauty is um, to know that when you feel most out of sorts and things are the hardest, that once you move through it and get to the other side, and you will, um, you'll find a whole new level of beauty inside yourself. And I think ultimately that may be the biggest secret of all, that by taking on the hard and spending a whole life working toward solving and, or resolving that, you ultimately um, find your own deepest self and that's the best way to come home to who you are. So have a great day for all of you. And um, I think tomorrow I'll read a little bit longer. Take good care.